Guten Tag, willkommen in der Restmed Lounge. Wir wollten Sie einladen, mit Professor Sullivan eine kleine Frage- und Antwortrunde zu betreiben. Er ist hier, wir haben das Glück, dass er dieses Jahr beim, beim DGSM und beim, äh, beim Zahnärztlichen Schlafmedizinkongress ist. Und da wir aus der Erfahrung wissen, dass es viele Fragen gibt, auch heute Morgen schon bei seinem Vortrag viele Fragen aufkamen und auch heute Abend ist sicherlich bei unserem Symposium einige Fragen gibt, aber die Zeit dann Richtung Gesellschaftsabend kurz wird, haben wir gedacht, wir laden ihn hier in die Lounge ein, sind froh, dass er da ist und ähm, wollten jetzt einfach über ähm, ja, häufig gestellte Fragen an ihn letztendlich mit ihm eine kleine Diskussionsrunde machen, weil es schon spannend ist, wie man auch heute schon heute Morgen in seinem Vortrag gesehen hat, wie, wie, wie beschwerlich der Weg war auf dem Weg zu den, zu den heute verfügbaren Produkten, die wir gerade hier auf, dem, auf diesem Kongress finden und was man nicht vergessen darf, dass, dass das Wachstum der Schlafmedizin ist vor allem die respiratorische Schlafmedizin gewesen, weil wenn wir uns die Fallzahlen in deutschen Schlaflaboren anschauen, ist über 90 Prozent respiratorische Schlafmedizin, das heißt das Wachstum auch gerade dieser Gesellschaft und des, des Feldes ist sehr stark abhängig gewesen von der Entwicklung des CPAPs. Und ähm, zum anderen muss man auch sagen, ähm, er nannte das heute schon mehrfach der Invisible Disease, dass obstruktive Schlafapnoe sozusagen nicht, nicht erkennbar war, was auch daran lag ist, ähm, wenn man sich in der Medizin anschaut, man hat eigentlich selten nach Dingen gesucht, die man nicht behandeln konnte. Ja, so dass wir einfach die Zeit jetzt mit ihm die nächste halbe Stunde nutzen wollen und ähm, einfach, ähm, er wird Fragen beantworten und ist sein Deutsch, wie wir heute schon festgestellt haben, er, er braucht hm. noch zwei Wochen, hat er gesagt, in zwei Wochen, in two weeks, ähm, äh, äh, ist, 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 ist er wieder ähm, flüssig mit äh, fließend im, 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 im Deutsch sprechen, ähm, weil er hat in der Schule fünf Jahre Deutsch, it may be three, but um, maybe four. Ähm, <lacht> <lacht> aber Well, with a good sleep, it might be too. So, um, aber wir werden es zweisprachig halten, sozusagen. Er, er wird die Antworten in Englisch geben. Wir werden einfach Zusammenfassungen in Deutsch geben. Wir können auch die Fragen hin und her übersetzen. Also Sie brauchen es ja nicht auf Englisch, sozusagen, mit ihm sprechen. Ja, so dass einfach, ähm, ich glaube, die, die, die interessanteste Frage, mit der wir mal starten können, sozusagen, ähm, und dann freuen wir uns, wenn, wenn, wenn Sie mit Fragen hinzukommen, ist, I think the most The burning question in the room is always, you know, how did you get the idea okay. to create the CPAP device? <coughs> well, my usual answer is that I don't know. <coughs> uh, uh, but it's, uh, and the way I answer it is to give you the context of what I was doing. And at the time, uh, my I had trained in Sydney as a physician and then I did a doctorate in physiology and I, uh, at that time physiology was measuring variables, blood pressure, airflow. Uh, and then I spent uh, some time in Canada where I worked with Dr. Philipson who had, had developed a model of measuring breathing in sleeping dogs. Um, then I returned to Sydney and my main role was to look after sick patients with respiratory failure <clears throat> but then I also started to look for patients with sleep apnea. They weren't there, we had to look for them and I also set up both animal models and human models of upper airway obstruction. The, the practical problem uh, that had to be solved to look at how breathing is altered by sleep was how to measure airflow. <clears throat> uh, the model that Dr. Philipson had set up was to do a tracheostomy, tracheotomy uh, <clears throat> of exactly the same type that we were then using for sleep apnea. So it was the skin heel to the mucosa. Yeah. So it was clean. Uh, when the dog ran around it could breathe normally but when we wanted to do the test we simply put the tube in through the trachea <clears throat> and with that we were doing the effect of hypoxia, hypercapnia and airway occlusion, so simulating obstructive apnea. <clears throat> uh, however that's not possible to do in human volunteers so part of the task was how to measure breathing, capture airflow and yet allow the person to sleep. So. In fact, what I did when I got back to Sydney was to look at how the response to obstructed breathing in the dog 
was different if it was at the trachea versus the nose. So in fact, I had to make nose masks, snout masks for the dog. Um, simultaneously, I was making masks for ourselves so we could measure breathing and occlude the airway. So that's the background to thinking about the CPAP, making positive pressure uh, quite a long time before I did the test. And the reason for that long time was that we didn't have patients. <clears throat> so I had to find a patient who it was possible to do the experiment on. And secondly, I had to work out how to uh, create a mask which seal. Uh, uh, so when I, the patient that I first did the test on was a very sick sleep apnea patient who in fact had refused tracheotomy. And we, I said, well, would you agree to do this experiment? I may not work. Uh, and it, of course, did work. <coughs> and uh, that's where, uh, once it worked, it was actually had a, uh, a very, it was incredibly exciting. Because uh, initially, I thought we would do this experiment. Uh, we started it at about 9 o'clock at night, that we would try it out, finish at 11 and go home. But because it worked, we stayed there all night and of course he slept all night. And after we'd turned the pressure up and stopped it, dropped the pressure again, it came back, turned it up again, went away. Uh, you, we did not need statistics. It was a physical experiment and it worked. So then on the spot at the time, thought, well, let's stay here all night and see if it worked. It's interesting because now it all seems very obvious, but it was not obvious at the time. And initially, uh, I know when I presented that the, the reaction of most people was, why doesn't the air come out the mouth? And that's right. We thought we're going to pressurise only through the nasal airway. Why doesn't it come out the mouth? I remember the moment it worked, uh, uh, I sort of realised that that's telling us something about the anatomy, about the structure, that the soft palate and tongue must be working together. <clears throat> and then, of course, realised that that's part of the problem. If, if the person who is snoring and obstructing could breathe through the mouth, they wouldn't have sleep apnea. So they, it really taught us something very much about the anatomy straight away. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, we... Initially, I saw it was an experiment, not a treatment. Uh, and of course, uh, it led to us thinking, ah, there's a whole lot of experiments to do, which we did. We did a whole series of experiments. And my first five patients were all patients who were booked in for a tracheotomy. <clears throat> they were really sick patients. And they would come into hospital. We would do the tests and then they were meant to have a tracheostomy, which four of the five did. Uh, but one of my patients, after he tried this, said, oh, I will try it. Let me try it at home. <clears throat> and that's how we got started with the home therapy. The problem then was that there were really no suitable masks, although there were many masks for anaesthetic, uh, for protecting you from dust. Uh, none of the masks would provide a pressure seal or be sufficiently comfortable to use for six, eight hours a night. So we very quickly started to manufacture masks which we cast. We'd make a cast of the nose and make a very uh, close-fitting mask uh, which initially was uh, sealed with rapid, rapidly setting silastic, uh, a medical grade silastic. Uh, we also put a circuit together. Initially, the first, very first take home uh, CPAP machine uh, was the, uh, a two stage vacuum cleaner fan. Uh, not as people think my mother's vacuum cleaner, it was a two stage <laughs> vacuum fan which we set up in a box and had a belt drive from an AC motor. Okay. And we had an inlet tube and an outlet tube uh, separate from the motor so that if the motor burnt out, 
there would be no uh, toxic gases. So that was the first machine. Were you aware of that in 1936, there was a group of American um, uh, specialists in, in heart failure yes. who used <clears throat> the blower of a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Barack, 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 Barack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, n well, no. At the time, I was not aware of that okay. work. Um, uh, but in looking back at it, mm -hmm. they were actually treating. They didn't realise that they would have treated upper airway obstruction, but their thinking was that it was lung. Uh, but. I was going to say that our first, although that was the first machine, I think you mentioned that we very quickly found a relatively inexpensive flow generator, the Hitachi Vortex Blower, did you mention it I think already, um, which was really only several hundred dollars for us to purchase and it produces a very high flow, very large pressure and because it was so inexpensive for us, uh, we, we started to use them immediately. But the circuit we had to make uh, had very large pipe coming from this mach machine and a T-piece leaking most of the air to atmosphere. Uh, and that gave us, a, if you like, a pressurised circuit, a pressurised atmosphere from which the subject was breathing, but with a very low impedance meaning if they didn't take, although the pressure might be 10, they didn't need to generate much pressure differential to get an inspiration, and they didn't need to increase the pressure too much to get expiration. But how we set the pressure, once we worked out what they needed, what was, we would actually set a fixed valve which would leak pressure to atmosphere and give a pressure at the mask of 9, 12, 7, etc. Wasn't that first device too noisy for a home use? I mean, we, we have people complaining yeah. about modern devices and saying, well, I can't use that, so... so. Oh, well, modern people. But <laughs> well, no, it was very noisy, but in fact it was such a big source, we'd, it would typically be put in outside the bedroom and we would use quite a long pipe to come into the bedroom. Um, I think one thing that's very important to recall is that at that point we were seeing the really extreme degree of sleep apnea so most of the people we saw were really severe sleep apnea so uh, to go from uh, 90 decibel snoring to a, a mere uh, blower in the corner was not a big problem um, <laughs> and and in addition they they got so much benefit from it that's what drove the area that they'd be awake uh, um, I think one of the, although today with these uh, beautiful machines and masks, it's hard to look back at what it was like, uh, but it actually took a long time for people to take the therapy seriously, uh, particularly among medical colleagues who had, couldn't, uh, their acceptance of this invisible disease took a long time, still does. I mean, still some people who think, oh, it can't be very serious. And then, moreover, not only is this strange invisible disease, but you're using a, uh, a pump and a mask. Uh, so that was a lot of resistance to it being accepted, particularly among medical people. In, in, indeed, the a lot of the drive for us doing it came from the patients because we'd have patients who, were, as you know, these people in, often in a terrible state go on treatment and wake up and feel, oh, I have not been awake for five years. So, this is, so that's one, that was the big driver uh, in the early days of this therapy. When was the first time you really felt that CPAP would become part of medical practice. <coughs> when, when did it change? Well, the, the, when, when weren't you too exotic on conferences? Yeah. Well, uh, I put it into context that my, my clinical work was looking after sick patients with respiratory failure. So I'd uh, had put, I'd had quite a number of patients we'd done tracheostomy on uh, and with great benefit. Um, and Initially, uh, I did see the therapy as a rescue therapy, which would give us time, uh, help the patient recover, and prepare them for surgery, whether it be uh, 
UPP or whatever, because that surgery was starting at that time. Um, so in addition, uh, because I'm very much a clinical scientist, uh, the, the experiment that this provided was so exciting, uh, that was a big driver for us. We, we were seeing the opportunity to do measurements. Uh, the, the, as you know, these people have unbelievably uh, severe hypoxia, repeated hundreds of times. And that was simply not possible to get, you couldn't contemplate doing an experiment like that in a normal subject or even in an animal subject. So our dog experiments, we couldn't get permission to do hypoxia that these patients do. So we, we had this incredible <coughs> experimental model. And you know, what we started doing was taking the patients, we're measuring growth hormone, measuring ventilatory responses, measuring blood pressure before and after treatment. So when I think back, because of my interest in the science, that was a big driver for us. I mean, of course, it was wonderful to have the patients treated. It probably didn't <coughs> really emerge that I would see this as a long-term treatment really until the early 1980s, when 81, 82. And really what happened is that it became clear that the surgery that was being done was not working. Uh, and so it did have some benefit. Uh, and yet, in contrast, this therapy completely switches off sleep apnea and had such great uh, clinical responses. But it took a long time to, uh, every time I'd have a patient who'd come back, he'd been on this for three months, and, I, and they'd say, well, when are you going to cure it, doc? <laughs> when, when's the treatment? And I'd say, well, we're working on it, maybe next year, maybe the year after. <laughs> when, I mean, so we're, we're in 1985, and, and there you have now 100 mm. patients treated, yes, and, and I guess there, there is more demand coming up. Yes. So, so, so how did you manage? I mean, you, you've got an in increasing clinic with sleep aging. Yes, and, oh yes. No, well, just one point for, for, for the audience, what has to be sure, made sure for us is you build each of those 100 devices Yes. and 100 masks. Yeah, that's and, right. And that's you, right. how long were they lasting, especially the masks? Well, the masks last for a long time because the, the, the mask was made like a shell, okay. uh, uh, initially out of fiberglass, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, how it was put on was with a small amount of uh, this rapidly setting silastic, which they'd put in, and it, it was I, I, it sort of glued on. Uh, but then in the morning they could peel it off and it would fit very nicely again for several nights and then they'd have to replace that. Um, I think, yes, we made them. Uh, I did, at the same time, uh, I had, um, I forget how much work there was, but we were, had to establish a clinic. So I, I had to get space in the hospital to establish a clinic. I had to fight to get space for sleep lab, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, my facility at the university, I always had a workshop, electronics, uh, mechanical, and I had a technical officer. In fact, um, my technical officer who joined me was uh, a Swiss German, Jim Bruder, his name. His family came from Basel, and he was he actually joined me and was making these. We got so busy, I also employed one of my patients who was on non-invasive ventilation to actually put the devices together. Can I, can I just add one thing that I just recall is that when we first started using the therapy, I did think that there might be recovery and that after treatment was used for a week, a month, two months, that they may improve. And we did a whole series of studies where we did the diagnostic study, treatment for five days or six days, and then repeated the study, and then similarly treatment for a month and repeated the study. And in all of those patients, they undoubtedly improved. The severity of apnea always got better. And it, initially we were thinking, ah, oh, maybe we could have pulse therapy five nights on, holiday for the weekend, etc. And we tried that, but found that we were far better to get people to take it as regularly as they could.
Can I add something else? Uh, uh, people assume that uh, I'm an evangelist for CPAP. However, I'm constantly looking for other ways of curing this disease. And I would, uh, we, be, we, we haven't talked about it today, but there is a very important, continuing important role for surgery. Uh, a surgeon is important to fix the nose, and make sure you have a good upper airway. Uh, there's an important role for oral devices. They have a they have a very important place, and I I think it's still important for our surgical colleagues to keep thinking about how to improve the upper airway. I send and work with uh, oro oro maxillary surgeons to actually do major surgery for young patients, thin patients with clear, uh, you know, who are going to face a lifetime of sleep apnea. So. The only problem with that form of surgery, of course, is it's a big deal and it's expensive, etc. But in a young, in a 19-year-old, thin person, he's got bad apnea, I will be looking down that path. And it's making sure that airway's clear with the surgery, looking at what you can do, and then uh, that's always done in link, linked in with orthodontists. So you've got to make sure the teeth are in the right place, expand the maxilla, and bring it forward. So I'm very clear that I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a salesman for CPAP. I'm always looking for my patients. Can I cure this problem?